Well, good morning. It's good to know that you're awake. Jackie's got you. I'm going to ask you to do what I'm doing. Will you take out your Bibles? And I also want you to keep your, did they get their, stu- you have your study guides, yes. I want you to keep your study guides handy too because we are gonna take a look at the back of your study guide on page 124 later this morning if you want to have that out and handy. Okay. I'm getting everything ready here. How many of you are glad to be back this morning and ready for some routine in your life? Me too. I'm ready for that as well. And you know, Jackie said that I've been in God's word for a long time. Um, I have through BSF and that's been a really good foundation for me. I accepted Christ when I was 19. Um, He was my savior, but it was a long time before he was my Lord. Um, But I'm thankful that I have caught that and love his word. So, but Nehemiah is not a book that I have studied extensively. I knew he's cupbearer to the king. Yes, I've read it, but do I know it deeply? Did I know it deeply? No, do I know it deeply now? Yes, Um, but I wanna encourage you, if you don't know the book of Nehemiah real well, that we're on a learning curve um, together. And that's one reason that I ask you at the end um, of November to go home and read the book of Ezra and the book of Nehemiah, and then if you have time, to read the book of Esther as well. And I also wanna be clear about something else these next 10 weeks. I am standing on the shoulders of so many wonderful teachers, commentators, um, pastors that I've listened to in preparation these last four months to teach you the book of Nehemiah. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of those names. So I have studied some of Matt Chandler and Kathleen Nielsen and Kelly Minter and John Boyce and Ray Steadman and David Guzik and Watermark Church and Stephen Cole, who's in Austin and Blue Letter Bible. And I use Bible Gateway all the time as well. So I've learned a lot, and that's my prayer for you these next 10 weeks, is that Nehemiah becomes a household name uh, around your house. So let me open in prayer this morning before we get started. Oh, Father God, I just not only bend my knee, but I bend my heart. And I pray, Lord, that you squeeze out of me anything this morning that is not of you, that, Lord, um, if these women don't catch anything these next 10 weeks, that they would catch a high view of who you are. What an awesome and great God that Nehemiah loves and that Nehemiah talks about and worships and prays to and depends on and trusts. That's my prayer, Lord, that we grow right along with Nehemiah in knowing who you are and having a high view of you. So Lord, please do in and through me what I am not capable of doing myself. Equip me, Lord, to teach your word in your precious name, amen. How many of you like to have a good foundation before you get started? Okay, so if you said yes this morning, that's a good thing because that's what I'm gonna give you this morning. In this introduction, I'm gonna give you a good foundation. And we're gonna talk about the nation of Israel as a whole so that you can understand how we get from Genesis to the very end of the Old Testament in the book of Nehemiah. And if you remember in November, I told you that in Genesis, the the curtain was opening or going up on the book of the Old Testament. And in Nehemiah, the curtain is actually going down. So if you were to open up your Bible and you can do it at any time, and look at your table of contents. If you had to go to your Bible to find Nehemiah, you're gonna find him about a third of the way through your table of contents um, in the Old Testament. However, he's at the very end, and we're gonna look at several slides this morning. So the Bible has 66 writings called books of the Bible, and it was written over a span of about 1,500 years by more than 40 human authors, and they were carried along by God to record God's words. And if, did it come, okay, see it's behind me, I'm wanting to look that way. 
So we know that all scripture is God-breathed and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training us in righteousness. And I think we'll see that as we study Nehemiah. We want to understand from the very beginning <clears throat> that the word of God is written by God, not man. And the first thing I want to show you is how the Old Testament is divided. You should have received an email, hopefully you did, yes, from your leader. With, okay, good, that's a good thing. Um, and for some of you, this may be brand new information. But, and for some of you that go, I know all that, hang in there with us because God can still use you to teach that to somebody else. So here's this first diagram. And this covers the 39 books of the Old Testament. Like I said, you might wanna bracket these as I go through and talk about them. So there are different forms of writing in the Old Testament. We'll talk about those. And without going into too much detail, I am gonna give you a little bit of history this morning. So the first five books are called the books of the law. And you see those here at the beginning, the Pentateuch or the Torah. Now, if you think about this like a bookcase, that will kind of um, help you. The first five books of the Bible are basically in chronological order, with the exception of Job that was believed to be, have been written around the time of Genesis, if not a little bit before. And here we know from our study, from Genesis in the fall, that this is where God establishes his relationship with the nation of Israel. And it also answers the question of how the Israelites got to Egypt in the first place. So you should um, be able to remember that. And then Exodus tells us how God saved Israel from slavery in Egypt. And when we left off in Genesis, if you can remember that Israelites were prospering, they were in a really good place. They had settled there. They had been given the choices of land by Abraham's great-grandson, Joseph. But Joseph dies and a new Pharaoh comes in and then he thinks that the Israelites are a threat. So he decides to make them slaves. But God hears their cries. He remembers the covenant that he made with him that we talked about in Genesis. He raises up Moses to lead the people out of Egypt um, to the promised land. And if you um, remember, he led them by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. I'd like to be led by that, like so I'd really know where God was leading me. Anyway, so the book of Leviticus is next. And in a nutshell, this is teaching the people how they need to worship God. This is where God gives the ceremonial laws, whereas in Exodus, we're given the moral laws. So like the 10 commandments and stuff. And then Aaron, Moses' brother, is ordained here as the formal priesthood for the nation of Israel. And here it lists the blessings and the obedience, the blessings and the uh, punishment for disobedience is what we'll find here. And then in Numbers, which we're also gonna see something like this in chapter eight in uh, Nehemiah, this is where there's a census. This is a recording of the people. Here they begin their march towards the promised land and it's a journey of only 200 miles, and it should have taken them less than two weeks to get there. However, how long did it take them? 40 years. It took them 40 years. They grumbled and they complained against Moses and against the Lord. And I can tell you that when we rebel against God, it is going to take us the long way around. And I'm testimony to that. Disobedience, ladies, is not the direction that we wanna go. We want the blessing of obedience. So God decrees that an entire generation of people would die in the desert and he would raise up a new generation of people that are more obedient to take into the promised land. And then the last book here is Deuteronomy, meaning second law. And this is where the words of Moses are recorded. And these are the final words that are given to the Israelites before they go into the promised land. And Moses reminds this generation, because remember, he didn't get to go, but he reminds this generation about God's command and, as, and about their national history as God's chosen people. So a lot took place in these first five books. With the exception of the first five books of the Bible, the rest of your Bible is basically not in chronological order and we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. So then that next section that you're gonna look at are, is the historical 
uh, narrative. So these are the books Joshua through Esther. Don't worry, I'm not gonna go through every single book. But this tells us about the people, it tells us about the places and the history of the nation of Israel. Here it talks about um, the challenges of God's people to rectify themselves according to the law and before God brings judgment on them for their disobedience. So in the historical narrative, we also learn about the three kings that were in place when the nation of Israel was a united nation of 12 tribes. So here we have Saul and then David and then his son Solomon. We also learn here why the nation of Israel fractured, why they um, were the northern and the southern kingdom. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So where we're going to land when we study Nehemiah is after the 70 years of exile, when they rebuild the temple and the walls of Jerusalem, and I'll show you um, on a slide here in just a second. So next, you just see in the middle those poetic or books of wisdom or poetry, um, and here's where we see the book of Job as well. We have the Psalms, which are basically a songbook. And this is where the people cry out to God. It's where they um, glorify God. It's also where they complain and they just pour out their heart to the Lord. David is attributed with writing about half of those. Proverbs, which is a great book to take your kids through. That's a book of wisdom. And we sometimes call that a book of probabilities. If you do this, then this will happen. If you do this, then that's gonna happen. Don't do that. So there's 31 of those, and that allows you to read one a day each month. Then we have Ecclesiastes, and that is basically showing you that life apart from God is empty and meaningless. And then Song of Songs or Song of Solomon, uh, gives us a picture of what a godly marriage looks like. And it's PG-13 rated, if you've ever heard of TA from Breakaway. So then next, you're gonna see the prophetical books of the major and the minor prophets. And you're gonna think major, more important, right? Minor, not so important. But that's not the case. The only difference is the major prophets, the books are longer, and the minor prophets, the books are shorter. Um, they foretell of God's coming judgment as well as what a merciful God is to this unfaithful, stiff-necked nation of Israel. And guess what? We're the same way. And all this takes place over hundreds of years. So it's quite a jump from Genesis to Nehemiah. And when you look at all this, don't let your eyes glaze over and just think, oh, this is a lot of information. Having a working knowledge of the scripture and the lay of the land is gonna help you better understand the book of Nehemiah. Okay, look in the back of your study guide. Look at page 124. Okay, so the Israelites have been led out of Egypt toward the land of milk and honey. Joshua leads them in a successful effort to rid the land of the ites. We call those the parasites, the Hittites, the Canaanites, the Jebusites, and on and on it goes. Um, so he divides the nation into 12 tribes. He reminds them to stay true to God's word, but guess what, that doesn't happen. The people of Israel decide that they want to be like everybody else around them. They want to be like all the other nations, and they ask God for an earthly king. This is where they make their big mistake. When they ask for an earthly king, they're basic, they are. They're rejecting God. They're saying, no, no, we want, uh, you know, somebody with skin on, and we want a, a human being to be our leader. So when they ask for that earthly king, God gives them what they think they need. And how often are we grateful that God doesn't give us what we think we need or what we might ask for? So if you look there, um, you'll see, and I don't have a study guide, but you'll see there where it lists Saul, well, it, does, it says David. Okay, so right above that, you would have Saul at about 1050 to 1010 BC, who starts off well, but he doesn't trust God. And then God brings in this shepherd boy named David. Yes, same shepherd boy, David and Goliath, it's that shepherd. And God's favor rests on David, even though he's sinful. We all probably remember the stories of David and Bathsheba. 
But the difference between Saul and David is that David recognized that he was a sinner and he cried out to God and he asked God for forgiveness and God's hand of favor rested on David. Now, when David died, um, the leadership was transferred to his son, Solomon. God put it on David's heart to build this temple for the Lord that we're gonna talk about that's been torn down. And he puts it on David's heart to build it, but God said no to David because David had shed too much blood in battle. So his son Solomon has the blessing and privilege of building that temple. And in my quiet time this morning, as the Lord would have it, I was in John chapter two and it talked about the temple and how it took 46 years to build it. So Solomon's kids were rebellious and this is when the nation of Israel split into two. So this would have been like the United States during the Civil War if we had actually split. And thankfully, we didn't. But they go from one wicked king to another wicked king instead of trusting God and following after the Lord. So God allows the northern tribe of Israel, which are 10 tribes, he allows the Assyrians to capture them and to drag them into exile. They were scattered, just like God said, throughout the known world. And the Assyrians, they scattered the nation of Israel because they were less effective. They couldn't be as cohesive and rise up and rebel. So they're scattered everywhere, just like God said. And then the southern kingdom, they lasted a little bit longer, um, but eventually they were captured by the Babylonians And if you remember in Genesis, this is the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. They had a righteous king and a not so righteous, a wicked, a righteous and a wicked king. But 136 years, like I said later, they fall to the Babylonians. And that ladies is when that temple that we're gonna talk about is destroyed and it's when it's burned down and they are dragged into exile and scattered just like the Northern tribe. So at this point in the history of Israel, it looks like God's covenant promises are blown. But where, you know, where is God? The nation is a wreck. So then what happens is the nation of uh, Syria and Babylon, they're sacked by the Persians. So now they're no longer the, uh, rule, the ruling nation of the world. So how do we come up with that 70 years of exile? I don't know about you, but I like for things to make sense. So if you look at that timeline, find 1000 BC, and then look down a little bit farther where it says, first exiles to Babylon, 605. You see that? Okay, that is, and she doesn't really go over this in your notes, in in your introduction, and that's one of the reasons I wanna make it clear. This is when Daniel and his companions, remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, this is when they are taken into Babylon, so they're considered the first captives taken by the nation of Babylon. Um, Okay, so 605 minus 538, which is when God allowed them to go back to rebuild the temple, that's the 70 years in fulfillment of Jeremiah 29.10, which, not having my glasses on, I don't know if I'm in the right place, no. I'll find it in just a second. Okay, but why? Why would God allow his people? These are his chosen people. These are his set apart people. These are the people that he made all his covenants with. Why is he allowing them to be drug into exile, made to be slaves and captured? And we learn why. The Lord, the God of their ancestors, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place, God did try to get their attention, just like he tries to do that in his word to us. He gave them the law to follow. He gave them faithful leaders. Um, He gave them the major and the minor prophets that went to them and warned them over and over again, if you do this, this is gonna happen. But they didn't listen. What did they do? 
They mocked God's messengers. They despised his words. They scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people and there was no remedy. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians who killed their young men with sword in the sanctuary and did not spare young men or young women, the elderly or the infirm. God gave them all into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. God does what he says he's going to do. And after 70 years is up, God uses the king of Assyria to issue a decree to the nation of Israel. But let's continue on. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and I will fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Hence, Ezra and Nehemiah. This is where we are. So, if you read uh, the book of Ezra, and, and wait, let me back up a little bit. So why, the, why is this such a big deal that God would bring them back and do this through this pagan king? Let's see. I'm backing up a little bit. So he carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, this is Nebuchadnezzar, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king and his officials. They set fire to God's temple, which we'll study. They broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and they destroyed everything of value. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword and they became servants to him and his successors until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest. All the time of its desolation, it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah. And this is a big deal because God is gonna raise up, move the heart of a pagan king to rebuild his temple. Not his people. He's raising up a pagan king who issues a decree. Hang in there, we're getting close. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fill, fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put in it the right, put in writing, which that's what made it a law, a decree, it was put into writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, which is crazy there that he would call him the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up and may the Lord God be with them. This is why I ask you to read Ezra. The last verse in 2 Chronicles is the first verse in the book of Ezra. Okay? So they're being, um, Ezra and Nehemiah are being written at approximately the same time. If you had an ancient Hebrew manuscript or text, you would see that the book of Ezra and Nehemiah are actually one book. Some would even lump uh, the book of Esther in there. And scholars differ, they argue about who wrote it and things like that. Um, we're not gonna worry too much about that. But we do know that at least the first seven chapters are written by Nehemiah because they're written in first person. And so it's basically what we're gonna do when we first study those seven chapters. We're gonna be looking into like Nehemiah's diary or his memoir. So if somebody were to pick up yours, they would know all the things that happened to you during that time. Okay, so God sends this man named Ezra back to Israel with this remnant of people, which was over 50,000 people to rebuild this temple. Now that sounds like a lot of people, doesn't it? 50,000, okay? But that's only two to 3% of the nation of Israel because by now there are millions of people. He says that, they, that any of them can go, but only a few answer the call. Why? Why did only a few wanna go back? to their homeland, to the land that God promised them. Well, it's because they got comfortable. 
It's because they got used to what was familiar in Egypt. Even though they were slaves, they were still prospering. And this is where the Jewish nation learned to be successful merchants. And I'll talk about that in another lecture. They were intermarrying, they were intermixing with other nations, they were worshiping their pagan gods. So they were very comfortable and also doing exactly what God asked them not to do. Okay, so now we are just gonna look at a first, just a couple, oops. See, when you can't see, well, poo. What happened to verse five? Well, it might have disappeared, but I've got it. Okay, so then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, whose, everybody whose heart God moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. And you know what's cool? All their neighbors assisted them, gave them articles of silver and gold and goods and livestock and valuable gifts and free will offerings to send them back to rebuild Israel. And one of the things that I thought about is it's a lot easier just to write the check than it is to go and do the work. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in his temple. Ugh with his pagan God. So that's kind of, that part's really yucky. So the book of Ezra records the fulfillment of God's promise to return the Israelites, the Jews, to their land after 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And it happened under three Persian kings and a number of Jewish leaders. And it took years for them to rebuild, 22 years to rebuild that temple. And again, chapter one through six in Ezra, tells us about the, that rebuilding effort, but it's actually under Zerubbabel and King Darius, and then chapter seven through 10 are under King Artaxerxes and Ezra. How many of you are saying, are we there yet? We are. We're at Nehemiah, and I'm gonna take a drink of water. <laughs> okay, what do we know about Nehemiah? who's the main character that we're gonna study this year or this semester. He's not a priest and he's not a scribe like Ezra. He's just an ordinary guy called to an extraordinary work of the Lord. We're gonna learn that he works for the king of Persia, King Artaxerxes as his cupbearer. We learn that he lives in the citadel, which is a, the fortified palace of the Persians. So we know since he's in the palace, he's a pretty important guy. He's a Jew, he's part of God's chosen people who have been in the land, uh, or who've been in exile. It's all he's ever known. He's never lived in Jerusalem. He grew up his whole life in a foreign land, but he's still concerned about his people. He's still concerned about the condition of things that are going on. Like I said earlier, we know that he wrote the first uh, seven chapters because it's written in first person, so we're reading his memoir, memoir, diary. We learn right away from the very beginning that he is a man of compassion and he's focused on other people. He's looking outward. He's a man of ability, he's a man of courage, and he is a man of action. He's a man, as one of my friends says, Y'all will hear me talk about the Fab Five all through. It's my people that keep me accountable to being God's word every morning. There's five of us. We're not really that fabulous, but God's word is fabulous. So anyway, she always, she uses this statement. Nehemiah is not a man that jumps dumb. That means he is a thinker, he's a planner, and he knew the importance of not moving until God gave him the green light and said, now. Now you go. He was a wise delegator. He knew it was important to organize the people around him in the rebuilding effort. He met a lot of opposition, we'll study that, but he kept his eyes on the Lord and he trusted him. He knew God's law and he called the people to adhere to it. 
And because Nehemiah was a man of great integrity, that caused other people to want to follow him. It was his integrity and his compassion for people and many other attributes that gave Nehemiah moral authority that the people respected and wanted to um, follow. So, but the most important thing that we're going to learn about Nehemiah this, these next 10 weeks is that he was a man of God. He was an incredible prayer warrior, and we'll see that theme of prayer throughout these 13 chapters. So the Lord positioned Nehemiah right where he needed to be in this time in history to do the, this great work in the kingdom of God. But before God could use Nehemiah, he had to do a work in Nehemiah's heart. He had to move Nehemiah's heart to conviction, to have compassion on these people that he didn't really know. So open your Bibles with me to Nehemiah chapter one. We learn right off the bat that the nation is in great trouble and distress or the people in Jerusalem. And I thought, how can I make this relevant to you guys? Um, we live in a very prosperous nation. Um, but I doubt anybody in here would forget 9-11. Some of us more vividly than others. You may even remember exactly where you were when you got maybe that phone call or you turned on the TV. I remember I was in the library helping the kids with computer time and one of the kids from the classroom brought me my phone because it wouldn't stop ringing. And if you've ever gotten a phone call like that, you don't forget where you are, you remember, and you don't forget those images that you saw on TV. And my girlfriend was telling me about the planes that had hit the Twin Towers and that her brother was actually at the Pentagon and she had no idea where he was. And so, like Jerusalem, at that point in history, the United States was in great trouble and disgrace because this totally snuck up on us and they never saw it coming. Now, I'm not from New York. Maybe some of you are, I don't know. Um, but weren't you distressed when you heard about this and the horrible atrocities and your fellow Americans? Wasn't your heart just wrecked? What Nehemiah knew was that the walls were torn down, the gates were destroyed, and the people were in distress. And it sounds a lot like 9-11, doesn't it? I remember my reaction was a lot like Nehemiah's. I don't know if yours was, but I cried. And I sat down and I wept. And I recognized how fragile things were, how unstable and what a dangerous situation that we were facing as a nation. I could have focused on my own little life in Texas versus New York that was 1,600 miles away. I'm not a New Yorker, but these are my people. These are fellow Americans. And it was overwhelming and it was hard to process. And we have so much coming at us through social media and through TV that we can actually become numb to the things that are happening in our world around us. But Nehemiah, he wasn't, he wasn't such a man. He responded and he responded quickly. And his first response was to pray. And one of the things that I heard that has really stuck with me, the news of the day is an invitation to pray. Oftentimes, there's not a whole lot we can do, but we can all pray when we see atrocities around the world. And it certainly beats turning off our TVs and returning to our normal lives. We're called to pray. And Nehemiah, he was a man of prayer, but he was also a man of action. He was saying, God, would you rescue this situation? Would you show me if there's anything I'm supposed to do about it? And God answered that because we learn in chapter two, verse 12, that God answered it by putting it on Nehemiah's heart to travel over a thousand miles and rebuild that wall. Nehemiah takes the initiative. He finds out what's going on. He cares enough to ask Han and I more questions about what's going on. And he responds with fasting and uh, mourning and prayer. And it says he does that for days. As we study this book, let's ask ourselves, what is God drawing me towards? How is God calling me to a person or a cause or somewhere that I can add value and help? 
In Nehemiah, we have an invitation from God to listen and to maybe discover something that he wants us to change. Maybe it's something personal in your own life that needs change. Maybe it's an area of brokenness. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a relationship that's broken down that needs to be rebuilt or restored. Could it be your finances or maybe your diet? Maybe you got that American Express and you went, whoa, after Christmas, I've got to get a handle on this. I've got to get my spending under control. Or maybe it's your prayer life. How are you neglecting your time with the Lord? So my prayer for us as we lean in and we listen, that we see what a powerful and effective God is it, he is and that his word is powerful and effective and it's gonna teach us and train us um, as we study. So Nehemiah hears about the walls that are broken down and the gates that have been burned. And in our culture though, we read this and we go, hmm, you know, no big deal because walls don't mean anything to us. But to the nation of Israel in, that, in, Jer in Jerusalem, the walls were everything to them. They were even more important than the army was because with those walls broken down, anybody could come in and invade them. Um, wild animals could come in, people could sneak up on them, kill their children, kill their spouses. They had no means of protection at all. It would be like you and I living out in the middle of nowhere and we leave all our doors and windows open or the walls in our house are broken down. Can you imagine living like that? You would be living in fear or you'd be sleeping with one eye open. And did you notice in verse three that Nehemiah calls these people survivors? They survived the exile. These people knew how to persevere. And this isn't the first attempt to rebuild uh, Jerusalem, the previous governors actually tried, but they didn't accomplish it. Accomplish it, but the man for the job was Nehemiah. He's a man who was moved by God to respond in obedience, but it wasn't just about rebuilding the walls. It was also about rebuilding the people around the word of God. And as we read about these survivors, we're gonna read about their joyful obedience, and we're also gonna study their really frustrating failures, how they had lots of opposition, and we can encounter that in our lives too when we wanna go about making changes, whether it's those New Year's resolutions that are already starting to kind of slide by the wayside, or maybe it's a long-term goal that you've had and it just always seems to be out of reach. It's a story about a leader who has incredible organizational skills and leadership skills, a story of restoration, rebuilding, restitution, fixing what's broken. But the bigger overarching plot line in the book of Nehemiah is about the promises that God made to his people. They reach all the way back to the beginning of the Old Testament and they reach all the way forward to us where we are now. And in their system of worship points us to our savior, Jesus Christ, who was the ultimate sacrifice that took our sins. And remember, rebuilding, it's hard work. It's a struggle sometimes to just walk by faith and trust God as we plod along to do what he's calling us to do. It does take perseverance. And maybe you're like these people in Jerusalem. Maybe you're that remnant. Maybe you're the only person in your family that's a believer. How might God be using you to bring the gospel to your family? God always has a faithful remnant. He promises that to us in Isaiah and in Jeremiah. He said he would always have a remnant of faithful Jews that would survive the exile and return to Jerusalem. We'll see the redemptive hand of God with this faithful remnant of survivors. And if you've read through it, you'll see that God recorded their names. He didn't forget them, and he doesn't forget our name either. And when we think about the great people in the Bible, who do we normally think about? Abraham, Moses, David, the apostle, um, Paul. But we aren't likely to lump Nehemiah in there. But we're gonna learn, as your note, notes point out in the introduction of your study guide, that the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem 
Jerusalem is exactly what allowed a place for our promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, to be born 430 years later. This is what makes Nehemiah such an important part of God's plan of redemption. It's a book that should inspire us to join God even when we're fearful, even when we have a lot of opposition and challenges. God designed each woman in this room to be a part of his plan. So, are you ready? Are you ready to look into Nehemiah and see about what service in the kingdom of God looks like? Are you ready to have tender hearts towards those who are in need? Are you ready to see the importance of prayer in your life and the sacredness of scripture? Ready to lean in, to listen, and to pray about what God is gonna lead you to through the book of Nehemiah. I'm excited. I know he has something for me, and I know he has something for each of you. Let me pray. Oh, Holy Father, stir our hearts for what stirs yours. Lord, begin with a conviction in each of us in areas of our lives that need to change because it starts with conviction, the prompting of your Holy Spirit. Move us, Lord, past conviction to action, to restore or to rebuild or to make the necessary changes in our lives. And Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to perceive and hearts that are willing, Lord, to move out of what is comfortable, what is familiar, and what is convenient to align our hearts with yours and where you're calling us. And it's in your precious name, amen. I've got to laugh at myself a little bit. And you know, I really prayed about this because I knew it would be kind of cumbersome for you guys and it's obvious the Lord had another plan, but um, I'm gonna show this to you anyway and don't go, whoa. This is gonna give you a visual of the chronological order of the Bible. Okay, we talked about these, so don't freak out. We've got the law, see the first five books? And then the historical narrative that tells about the nation of Israel. Okay, you see where all those arrows? And you know the prophets I talked about that are interceding, they're telling the people, um, this is what God says, this is what happens if you're disobedient. So you can see the prophets that spoke to the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, um, to the nations. Um, and then during that time of captivity. And then right there you see the 70 years of exile where Joshua um, is fulfilled. And then I talked about the 605 and the 538. Well, the 538 BC is right there at the beginning of Ezra, and that's how we come to the, uh, know that it was 70 years of exile. And the books down here are poetry and wisdom. So you see the United Kingdom and then the divided kingdom. So all this is taking place in the Old Testament, but God is at work in all of it. Um, to get their attention and to draw in his people. And it all prepares us to look forward to Christ. Okay. And if you want a copy of that, it's crazy, but it does help to give you a visual. Um, we can send it to you. Y'all have a blessed day. Thanks. Thanks.